Hey, I'm Daniel Strain from Future Earth, and I'm here with Helena Brown, a member of the Systems of Sustainable Consumption and Production Knowledge Action Network. Um, And we just listened to your talk, which was really interesting. And one thing you brought up is that when people talk about climate, uh, you know, uh, you know, adapting to climate change, they often talk about making behavioral change. But what you brought up is that it's actually less about behavioral change and more about um, changing what we conceive of as a good life. Can you explain that a little? Yes. Behavioral change is, uh, is, what counts as behavioral change is doing small acts of energy conservation, uh, buying good things. That's not what the cause of our carbon footprint is. It is the aspirations we have for a good life and how they translate to our lifestyles. So the idea, when we think about having children growing up in a safe and and, uh, appropriate uh, environment, we automatically think about a house in the suburbs with a little piece of land around it. We choose that lifestyles which locks us into a lifetime of high energy consumption uh, 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 lives, right? The bigger houses consume much more uh, uh, energy, we commute further, and so on. But we don't think about it when we make these decisions. How shall I live? Where shall I live? What home will I have? We don't think about it that this is a fundamental lifestyle decision that's going to determine our environmental impact for decades to come. And you said that's a conception of a good life that is brand new almost in, in human terms, is that we haven't always thought of giant houses as being what, you, what is necessary for a good life. Yeah. Well, everybody always wanted to have a nice, safe home and warm in the winter, cool in the summer, uh, to be able, able to, be, to provide for their family. But what happens in the Second World War, it's really a phenomenon of the Second World War where the industry, the, uh, the uh, construction industry, created the American suburb. It really did not. There were fringes of cities that were, that had public transportation. You know that there were individual houses, but the the suburbs, the way we understand them now, that uh, fairly f- uh, uh, large distances between the houses, uh, relatively big piece of land. Of no commercial activity nearby that, ca- that we cannot shop or do anything without getting in a car. That is a construct. This is a construct from uh, after the Second World War. And we bought into this construct and we now equate that with a good life. And it, but you said that there are examples of cases where people are almost going in the other direction, such as in, in Portland, where there's been a shift to actually have some smaller homes and, and to maximize space on, on lots and that sort of thing. Yes. I think that it's, uh, I cannot say what drives the people who elect to live in those units. I suspect that it's largely economical because uh, housing is becoming unaffordable for a lot of people in the middle class income. So, but perhaps some of these people also have bought into the idea uh, of the, the slogan that this program had was, uh, uh, what was, I'm trying to think of, build small, live large. All right. Yeah. So there are there are and especially younger generation that realizes that buying a very expensive home essentially enslaves them. It's a form of slavery. For the next 20 years, all your money is going into maintaining that thing, yeah. and you could be so much freer if you could live on a much less expensive, uh, uh, nice, nice home.